Hi again. I'd like to introduce you to our moderator for part two of our session. Megan Crawford joins us and is one of the leading female voices in the space industry and an experienced space startup executive and founder. She's the host of Mission Eve podcast that aims to increase the number of women in the space industry. Megan is a new space industry pioneer with a focus on the business of space, and she's dedicated several projects focused to building sustainable, profitable, successful space industry for everyone. She's the managing partner of Space Fund, a venture capital firm investing in space startups. In 2009, Megan began running the New Space Business Plan Competition, a program focusing on education, both entrepreneurs and investors, and catalyzing deal flow. As a manager, coach, and judge for the last decade, she's read over 1,000 space business executive summaries and has coached hundreds of selected teams and helped award cash prizes to dozens of new space startups. She holds an MBA in finance and entrepreneurship from Rice University, where she was selected to be the Texas Business Hall of Fame Scholar. Megan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for that great introduction, Christine. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and introduce the panelists for part two of our panel here. Um, Yusuf Urkel is the co-founder and CEO of Kernel Biologics, a Cambridge, Massachusetts-based biotech company developing messenger RNA 2.0 for cancer immunotherapy. Thank you for joining us, Yusuf. Um, Rich Thank Bowling you. is vice president of TechShot Inc., which develops, owns, and operates in-space research and manufacturing equipment. Great to have you, Rich. And Kevin DiMarzio is the Vice President of Business Development for Redwire Space. Redwire's mission is to enable reliable, economical, and sustainable infrastructure for the space industry. Uh, so we've got a great group here today. Not a ton of time to, uh, to talk about this exciting topic. Um, so let's just jump right in with our first question here. Um, so what are the benefits that are derived from manufacturing and production in space? And Rich, why don't you go first? Sure. So I, some of the other panelists from the previous session talked about uh, the absence of sedimentation or uh, convection in space, uh, things like that. Um, and so for some of our manufacturing projects, which many of them are life science related projects, we really take advantage of that. Um, so our, our 3D bioprinter, we call the, uh, the biofabrication facility or, or BFF, um, we take advantage of that so we can print uh, organ and tissue structures that don't collapse and one layer doesn't settle into the other. And we think that uh, although that technology is really in its infancy in space, we think it holds a lot of promise for use on Earth. And I'll say for the, the manufacturing perspective of that, so life sciences has its own amazing benefits for being able to use those support structures to actually grow in, in a much more relevant environment. And I think Christian even mentioned that on the last panel. When we look at actual advanced materials, things like metals or polymers, that lack of sedimentation actually allows us to explore novel material blends or even reshape how we're manufacturing components. So I think uh, Olivier, from MIT referenced that additive manufacturing has this great impact, and especially in microgravity of being able to use that kind of technology there. The microcrystalline structure is actually showing us that there are unique benefits to, act to manufacturing in the microgravity environment. And I could probably add a few words on nanomaterials, especially for, for RNA delivery. Uh, we believe microgravity constitutes a, a unique system uh, that can reduce the external forces that are exerted on these uh, nanomaterials. And these forces has, have a lot of impact on the on the final quality of the product that, that one is able to manufacture uh, here on Earth. We think by bringing these systems to, to the space station under microgravity, uh, we, can, we can take advantage of the uniform distribution of these, uh, these solutions that are used to produce the nanomaterials and significantly improve the quality of, of these nanomaterials. As mentioned in the previous panel, I will say this will require some convincing on, on FDA's part as well to, to make sure that they're also comfortable uh, allowing us to use these. But I think uh, with the right quality control systems in place, uh, FDA, as it has done in the past with, with, with this highly innovative track record in especially oncology, will, will likely be our partners in, in, in this novel way of thinking about manufacturing medicine. Wonderful. 
Um, well, there's there's been a lot of chatter about um, kind of the ISS as a national lab versus commercial space stations that are currently um, currently being uh, being put together, being built, being um, being commercialized, um, and so. If you guys could talk a little bit about the benefits of the national lab environment of the ISS versus these future commercial space stations, um, and and the reverse as well. What 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 are the benefits maybe of the commercial space station compared to the ISS? I'd love to get everybody's thoughts on kind of the differences and and the pros and cons on on each side of that. Well, so, think... Kevin, let's start with you this time. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's. That's a fantastic question. I think there's there's definitely a lot of nuance here as we're starting to explore and develop these facilities that will eventually replace or or help to to make the ISS transition towards the end of its life. The International Space Station is one of the best test beds that we have in our nation. And us being able to utilize that in so many different ways and even in the focus of actually developing a low earth orbit economy provides the one ground that we are able to access currently. So comparing to a station that doesn't exist yet, the International Space Station is really the only home we have right now to be able to really set up the foundation and the technology to actually go and produce this amazing economy that we're all striving towards. Now, with that, there's also all the help we receive from NASA and their partners, including the ISS National Lab, to be able to go and be successful. So with more of a commercial to commercial relationship, you may not be able to receive that same amount of help. And especially with the amount of expertise and history that those two organizations have at NASA and the National Lab, we're able to exercise that from our commercial business and really use that to propel us towards that great fantastic future. Now, if you flip that and say, why would we want to transition over to commercial space station? there's a lot of great reasons why the future should go towards commercial space stations. As we take a look at the International Space Station right now, it is limited in certain ways that allow us to test and pioneer these technologies, but not necessarily to create a consistent supply chain that you want with a commercial space station. And I think that's really the key differential here, where as we transition over, we still will need this kind of test bed to allow us to develop these technologies. But once we are actually generating consistent product and really the economy is flourishing. That's when that commercial space station and entity would be very, very useful to have to allow for that extra supply. Yeah, I think the ISS has been a great uh, tech incubator. You know, communities around the country have uh, entrepreneurial uh, uh, infrastructure, set of phys physical infrastructure besides, you know, Kevin mentioned you know the, all the, uh, the the counseling, consulting, the advice, which which is absolutely uh, invaluable as well. And uh, it just it's it's an incubator, a cradle, if you will, for some of these new technologies that uh, that we we get the opportunity to grow and fail and try and retry. Um, but you know, and some of the new stations coming online give us the opportunity to think maybe in different form factors. Mm -hmm. Maybe we've had a constraint in one way or the other, X, Y, or Z, and in physically the equipment and coming in on the ground floor as these new stations are being developed we have the freedom to think in in different directions and in different sizes and we have the opportunity to talk about power needs and needs for vacuum lines and cooling and things that we can we can talk about and and perhaps help design right from the get-go so it's it's a great new era and i'm really looking forward to, uh, to being a part of it then if I add, add uh, our own experience with, with, if I may add our own experience with ISS, uh, U.S. National Labs, which has been really tremendously supportive of our R&D experiments aboard the space station for our own collective or cancer cell specific m and &E work. Uh, yeah. the, the experiments that you design on Earth can, can, can be complicated if you add a, a, a space rocket launch and, and, and uh, transfer of, of all the payload and everything else. And uh, a significant amount of adaptation takes place when you think about performing these studies aboard the space station. And, and this requires a lot of uh, partners to come together and then work collaboratively. Our experience with, with ISS 
uh, crew, uh, uh, flight crew, as well as all the ground control teams and, and, and the sponsors have been uh, have been amazing. Uh, I, I would like to thank our, our sponsors at Cases, U.S. National Labs, and, and also Boeing, which have granted us an award uh, three years ago through Mass Challenge Boston uh, to, to perform these microgravity studies with, with, with cancer cells and normal cells and, and do a small screen for us. Um, I, I, I completely agree with, with, with Kevin and, and Rich in that uh, we, do, we, we will need commercial partners in this play as, as we think about the, the future of, of, of medicine, for example, uh, if we want to take advantage of microgravity-based uh, production systems, this will require a, a commercial partner, at least one, if, if not more, to also enable uh, the, the infrastructure in, in, in space. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite excited about the, the, the future of manufacturing in space as we look to expand uh, the number of options. You know, it's... Um... It's not every day that you hear everybody compliment a government organization. <laughs> so I just want to take a moment to call out cases. And, you know, at, at Space Fund, we have several portfolio companies that have, have worked with them as well. And it's just kind of glowing recommendations all around. So well done, cases, for being a government organization that people actually like. Um, that's great. <laughs> and um, really excited about the future of commercial space stations as well. Um, as we start ramping up and, and, and getting to those full production levels uh, that, uh, that start to make these business cases close in a whole new way for, for I think, all of your companies. So i um, very excited that that will be coming on online soon. Um, all right, so let's, let's shift gears here a little bit. I want to give each of you the opportunity to brag a little bit um, about the exciting things that you're doing and, and kind of share with the audience some, some real world examples of, um, of kind of the business use cases for, for the ISS. So if you guys could talk about just what was the most recent thing that you launched to ISS and what it's doing, how, how's the experiment going, um, and just kind of give us an update on, on what you've been up to. And uh, for this one, let's start with you, Yusuf, and, and hear about uh, cancer immunotherapy, which sounds super fun. Thank you, thank you, Megan. It, uh, it, it is quite exciting to be working with Amani these days, as, as Amani is literally saving the world from, from COVID uh, with, with each vaccination. Uh, Amani 1.0, as we define it, or non specific mRNA, has been doing tremendously well for vaccine development, uh, which is really the, the, the low hanging fruit for, for this technology. For mRNA 2.0, we, we've identified cancer cells as uniquely differentiated in terms of how they read the message. So when we deliver uh, encrypted messenger RNAs uh, that are in the right language, we can selectively go after these cancer cells, which is which is very exciting because cancer selectivity or specificity has been one of the limitations of existing immunotherapy agents that the, the, they overall increase the immune response, but they don't necessarily limit that immune response to cancer cells. And by being able to light up these cancer cells internally, by basically uh, using this altered genetic language against itself, we can, we can very specifically and precisely go after cancer cells. The, the, the launch uh, that we did with, uh, with NASA in, in uh, 2020, in October of 2020, involved our onco-selective messenger RNA candidates. These were messenger RNAs that were encrypted in that cancer cell-specific language. And we wanted to do a stress testing because previous microgravity studies had shown that the, the, the ribosomes that are responsible for reading the message are uniquely altered in, in microgravity. So this is really bringing the, the selectivity to the, to the edge of, uh, of stress testing, if you will, to, to see if our lead candidate that we want to bring to the clinic next year is still onco-selective, even under microgravity, which is known to alter that, that genetic language and, and how it's being read by the cells. So we shipped some cancer cells and some normal cells and we shipped a, a, a small panel of messenger RNA candidates, including our lead messenger RNA, to, to see how they would behave under microgravity versus how they do here on Earth uh, uh, under normal gravity. And we've shown that our lead messenger RNA candidate that we're, we're primarily focusing on this year has been indeed onco-selective. It's, it's still cancer cell specific. I like to use an analogy to explain the, the, the altered language uh, in cancer cells for messenger RNA translation. Uh, when, we, when we used our proprietary computational models to understand uh, the translatome or, or uh, proteomics data sets from cancer cells, 
uh, we've embarked upon some very interesting discoveries at Kernel, uh, namely that they actually use uh, some non-canonical uh, unique transmission events to read the message. So, so the analogy that I go with is that cancer cells almost speak a foreign language, like German, unlike all the other cells in the body that speak, let's say, English. So if you encrypt the message in German, you can very precisely go after cancer cells because the normal English-speaking cells would not even understand the message. So you could, you could actually encrypt uh, cell killing payloads. You can actually provide very interesting messages for cancer cells. And you can also do so in an immunogenic fashion to not only kill the cancer cell, but also result in a durable immune response that, that, that is really key to achieving long-term complete remissions or even cures. So, so th this novel, novel exciting uh, Messenger RNA 2.0 platform got ended up uh, being sent to space to, for additional de-risking. And I'm very happy to share today that our lead messenger RNA KR333 is uh, persistently onco-selective, even when you shake that, that, that the boundaries of no normal versus cancerous, even when you actually push the cells to microgravity to change that language. It's almost like the, the cells in space speak a different dialect of English or German. So our, our messenger RNA that we've selected for, for future clinical development is still able to differentiate between those different dialects of the language. And we think it will be ideally posed for, for clinical development where we will be facing a number of different patients with different biomarkers and then in different hereditary conditions or comorbidities in the clinic. We think uh, we, we are in a really good position to actually pursue this, this particular uh, drug candidate. Congratulations, Yusuf. No big deal. He's over here curing cancer. Oh, well, <laughs> I don't know how the two of you are going to follow that, <laughs> but Rich, why don't you go ahead and tell us what tech shot is up to? Yeah, so the the three legs of the tech shot milk stool, uh, one is uh, technologies for deep space exploration, one is uh, in space manufacturing that we're talking about mostly today, and one is equipment and services for research for our customers, not our research, but for our customers' research. Sometimes. Um, those things, those lines are blurred and, and uh, you kind of get a two for here and there. So the last thing we launched to the ISS, which is on board now, and, then, and we have we have four tech shot payloads on board the ISS right now. Um, I think maybe Redwire might have a speed there by a few <laughs> on that one. But so we have tech shot has four. And one of those is called the Advanced Space Experiment Processor. And we have uh, five of those. One One is now on board the station. And the last thing we did was we launched 128 uh, squid to the station, not not necessarily space manufacturing, but uh, they were launched inside of, of a research cassette inside of this ad set payload, which is a generic device that can do all sorts of research and experimentation. And that was that was uh, some experimentation for our customer at the University of Florida, uh, Dr. Jimmy Foster. But I mentioned these lines are blurred often, and so the ad set payload. Uh, which is still up there while the, the science came back down in the cassette, is going to be used early next year for some tests of something we are going to manufacture in space, which is um, some components of drugs. So um, you heard in the last session a little bit of discussion, I think, from Ken Saban talking about uh, Merck and Keytruda. And Merck is a key partner for us in the development of what we call uh, the Pharmaceutical In Space Laboratory, or PIL, because all of us on this panel know that a cool acronym is you know, like the first thing you do. And, and so PIL is a part of our uh, drug manufacturing uh, technology. And we're going to test some of the first small components of that inside a payload we already have on board the station, the, uh, the ad set payload. So that's the last thing we launched. And, and it certainly is an important part of uh, our space manufacturing efforts going forward. Excellent, excellent. Um, so, uh, Kevin, go ahead and tell us how Redwire has TechShot beat, as, as Rich said, um, but, uh, and then tell us a little bit more about your most recent payload. Well, def definitely not a, a beating. I'd say it's much more parallel pathing. I think we, we probably trade places quite often with how many payloads and, and experiments are going on up there. Um, right now, I, I think we may also have four facilities at the very least, but maybe there's some in storage too, so I don't, I don't know if I want to cheat. Uh, but for me, actually, we're launching something in seven days that I'm going to talk about, and then probably one that we launched earlier this year. But as Rich was mentioning, a lot some of these payloads are actually very cross-cutting and allow us to go and perform different activities. And one of the main things Redwire was known for when we were made in space at one point was the additive manufacturing facility. 
So that facility still resides on the International Space Station all the way back to 2016. And what we're launching is actually a, a insert for that that will manufacture with regolith. So we're going to use JSC-1 simulant, which is a lunar dust, and combine that with waste plastic to go and manufacture some test articles, basically allowing us to prove out towards what we're going to go and do on future Artemis missions. So this is actually just one of those other great ways that we're able to use this persistent microgravity environment on the International Space Station to go and prove out these technologies that will feed forward for human exploration. And this facility, we commercially own and operate and are able to use that in a variety of different ways. So this is not the only experiment that we've done that is separate from our polymer manufacturing, but it's very notable because we are funded to do that and are going to be doing it in about a week. So that's gonna be really awesome. The previous thing we actually just got back down about a month ago was we grew potassium diphosphate crystals, some inorganic crystals using a solution-based growth method in our industrial crystallization facility. So this is, has the, the initiative to be able to grow crystals that are much larger than anything you could do on here, down here on Earth due to gravity and sedimentation. So the way that crystal feeds and grows in the, that pattern is extremely limited and actually has significant defects when you get to a certain size here in a gravity field. So we were taking a look at that fundamental physics and saying, how can we explore using microgravity and that persistence to allow us to grow this unique product? So we actually just got down our first experiment of that. We launched that facility at the beginning of this year, and I think we, we took even a few months to grow it continuously. So it's gonna be interesting to actually open, open that casing up and see what we got inside. But we plan actually on using that facility uh, again to continue and really explore how we're going to be growing these types of crystals that ultimately we, we do want to use for not only scientific purposes, but for commercial sale. So this is a Pathfinder program that we were able to use the International Space Station on to develop a methodology that we can then translate to future stations or even grow in size in the International Space Station. So we are running out of time, unfortunately, gentlemen, but um, I wanna try and get one last question in here. Um, we, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about um, you know, moving over to kind of a commercial um, space station ecosystem that would allow for, for real large scale production and, and manufacturing. As you start to think about that very exciting economic future, what are the areas of the biggest opportunity that you see in, in space production and manufacturing? Uh, where, where, where's, the, where, where's the money to be made? Where are the real dollars? Um, and what are the biggest opportunities that you see? I can go first. Thank you. Uh, as, as, as someone who has also worked at Merck, uh, one of the big innovators in immuno-oncology space, uh, I, I, I do see the value of producing uh, pharmaceuticals in space, especially uh, pharmaceuticals that, that are more innovative and that are more advanced in terms of their, their uh, compositions. Uh, as I mentioned before, mRNA has been doing really well in the clinic. Uh, it, it's proven to be very safe, tolerable, extremely efficacious, much more so than existing modalities, as well as other emerging modalities. Uh, we anticipate a similar boost of improvement in efficacy and safety in, in cancer therapeutics with mRNA 2.0. And uh, the, the, the way these, these reagents are produced uh, in, in, on Earth involves uh, mixing them in at particular flow rates and at particular uh, microfluidic channels to make sure that you get the, the polydispersity index or, or, or the particle distribution, if you will, uh, that, that, that is within reasonable range of, of variability, that you don't have too much uh, particle size variability. Um, uh, any improvement that you can put into making that uh, distribution tighter and then making the, the particles more uniform actually has, has significantly improved the, the quality of the product, the, the, the potency of the product, as well as reduced batch to batch variability, which is a major concern for pharmaceutical development. So I personally think uh, the, the, the future of manufacturing messenger RNAs will, will uh, end up in, in, in space, and especially for particular applications where there are delivery challenges. For example, if you wanted to go after muscle diseases or, or cardiovascular diseases, this could especially be useful in, in, in bringing the nanoparticles to a size range 
and 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 uh, how this person index that is compatible with uh, high in vivo delivery potency. So I'm I'm, I'm personally quite excited about nano medicine in space. Excellent, thank you, Rich. How about you? Hard to improve on that. I mean, I agree. Um, three of the four manufacturing space manufacturing projects that we have ongoing right now are, are life science focused, uh, and they're really off Earth for the Earth, as as I know that um, you know the IS National ISS National Lab has said, and I you know that's that's certainly true. Uh, the one, the fourth one, is really. Um, manufacturing in space for use in space. We haven't talked about it, but it's it's a, a way to manufacture high strength uh, aerospace grade uh, parts out of titanium and manufacturing electronics, things like that. And uh, all those I love all of our children, you know, and uh, but but I but I agree a lot, the life sciences for four products to be used on the earth are where it's out for, for tech shot. And Kevin. Yeah, I'm going to show me the money. Uh, <laughs> I really like the life sciences aspect of that entire thing. So I'm not going to pick on that one. I'll go in a different direction. But I think generally for us, the way we think about it here at Redwire is we have to identify the product set that has actually a very low mass and volume, and very high output. So when we think about that, there's actually something, an initiative we started. And now I think the market is actually telling us where the opportunity lies, which outside of life sciences is actually over in optical fiber manufacturing. So this has been something that Redwire start, began pioneering a few years ago, and we've launched multiple times to the, the space station, but there are now multiple other commercial organizations that are pursuing this exact same type of technology. So I think the market is actually telling us that seems to be a, a, a very large amount of opportunity just considering the amount of organizations that are pursuing that. So I would I would pick on that outside of the life sciences if I had to choose. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your wonderful insights. Uh, we are right perfectly on time. So well done on that as well, gentlemen. Um, and thank you very, very much for joining us. Hopefully we get to do this in person next year. Um, but uh, this has been a great virtual experience nonetheless. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Rich, Kevin, and Yusuf. It's exciting to hear all about the cutting edge work you're involved in. And it's really going to bring in space production to reality. Building on the topics of this panel, we'll transition to our final panel of the day, a conversation with Dr. William Wagner, director of the McGowan Institute for Regenerative Medicine on biomanufacturing in space. Please be sure to click the button under the panel session title in the attendee hub. You won't want to miss this one.